Mr. Brian Mulrooney stepped aside at home, then the knives were out in Australia for Dr. John Hewson's GST. John Hewson campaigning in the Perth marginal seat of Stirling drew the now usual rowdy crowd of protesters. Some were fired by reports from Canada that the goods and services tax had brought down Prime Minister Mulroney. Canada's GST was introduced by Mr Mulroney without warning. It came on top of provincial sales taxes without any compensation package. There's absolutely no lesson in Canada for us at all except how not to do it. In Bendigo, Mr Keating must have thought the Chinese dragon had finally scared away the evil spirit of the GST. He seized on Mr Mulroney's problems with relish, blaming their GST for Canada's enduring recession. So at least the Canadian example demonstrates this point. It's bunkum to be arguing a monster spending tax can promote a recovery. Mr Mulroney had been there for nine years and he had an 11% unemployment rate. <laughs> and there's only one lesson to draw from that. Mr Keating should resign. With Labor facing defeat, some passion is entering the campaign. Supporters gave Mr Keating a rousing reception when he... He gave a a fairly uh, forceful performance there, uh, arguing that... Uh, you, you start it off there, Ted. Today at the National Press Club, with just a day and a half to polling day, the Prime Minister, Paul Keating. We, we take you now to the National Press Club in Canberra. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra. And uh, our guest this afternoon is the Prime Minister of Australia, Paul Keating, for a record-making 18th time. All of that done between August the 24th, 1983, and now March the 11th, two days before the 1993 federal election. It's been a long-standing tradition in Australian politics that the National Press Club welcomes in the last week of election campaigns the Prime Minister and the opposition leader for a campaign ending address. In fairness, uh, the club would like to point out that at the beginning of this campaign we not only invited uh, Paul Keating to address the National Press Club, but also the opposition leader, Dr John Hewson. He, uh, he and he initially accepted uh, the invitation to be here, I think uh, would have been last Tuesday. We also at the same time invited him to respond to uh, the Prime Minister's uh, investing in the nation statement, which was about two days into the campaign. Uh, initially, as I said, they accepted. Uh, subsequently, the opposition leader decided that his campaign priorities lay elsewhere. Anyway, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome, as I say for an 18th time, would you please welcome Paul Keating, Prime Minister of Australia. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Jim. It is a pleasure to be back, uh, as you say, for a record-making rather than record-breaking uh, appearance. Well, I, I thought he might have surprised us. I thought, seeing there was an election on Saturday, he might have come along for a debate. I thought he might have stopped impersonating American presidents, <laughs> stopped running, and come along to answer some questions from the people whose democratic purpose it is to ask them, but no such luck. Dr Hewson has broken one of the traditions of Australian politics. He's, a, he's in the business of breaking many. We don't have such a lot, of course, homegrown traditions, but one of them is that leaders make themselves accountable to the press 
in the week before an election. Dr. Houston has not answered a question of substance since Christmas. Every time he's been asked a question of substance, and that's about three times, he's fallen over. <laughs> Dr. Hewson has not been able to accommodate anyone who is asking for facts about his so-called plan. His campaign itself has been a falsehood. His imitation of President Clinton's campaign disguises the fact that what Clinton stands for, Hewson despises. Dr. Hewson has worn a mask in this campaign. If Australians have not seen behind it yet, they still have two days to go. Two days to peer behind the mask. Dr. Hewson has been unable to provide us with facts on the GST. He has said it will create two million jobs. He said that consistently. There's not one person in this room, I don't think there's one person in this room who believes that. Dare I say, there's not one economist in Australia who believes that. I venture to say, there are a good many people in this room and a good many economists who believe it'll create no jobs, or worse, that it'll actually cost jobs. <laughs> and of course, I'm one of the latter. I'm sure I'm not the only one to have heard reports in recent weeks of companies in my case, some of the finance houses of Sydney and Melbourne, which are planning layoffs of workers when the GST is introduced. This is the first great deceit of the Houston campaign. They say the GST will create jobs. The truth is the GST will not create jobs. I'd also venture to say that there's not one person in this room, nor I imagine is there one doctor in Australia who doesn't know that Dr Hewson is going to rip the heart out of Medicare and leave it, leave it a universal health care system in name only. <laughs> Dr Hewson would move the Australian health system towards the American system. The American strategy of pu publicly subsidising private health care and insurance has left 35 million Americans without insurance and given doctors and private health insurance companies the ability to unremittingly jack up health costs, just as they promised to do in Australia in their own journal, which the Sydney Morning Herald ran an extract from yesterday. In the Sydney seat of Lowe, we're told nine out of 10 doctors promise to increase their fees. It's a case of your money or your health. A doctor's stick up. <laughs> American healthcare costs are more than 50% greater than Australia's. 50% greater, and of course a fraction of the service. Last year in the United States, employer spending on healthcare exceeded total after-tax profits. Last year in Australia, employers paid nothing, paid nothing, and were that much more competitive as a result. And I can assure you, if there was a change of government, the first claim of the Australian workforce on the businesses of this country will be to pay their health insurance costs, just like the United States. And we'll see how good that looks against payroll tax. In America, a huge part of the population lives in fear of being sick or injured because of the health bills they would have to pay. Fear of unemployment in the United States is really fear about sickness. It's fear about not just losing your job, and not having an income, but actually getting sick while you're out of work. That's what Americans most fear. In Australia, the only thing to fear is the sickness itself. There are waiting lists in health, it's true. In the campaign speech, I announced action to remedy it by contracting out the treatment of public patients in private hospitals. This is additional to the 70 million we've given the states to shorten waiting lists. But if those waiting lists were twice as long, they would not constitute a reason to adopt the American health care system. This is the second great deceit of the campaign. The Liberals say they won't destroy Medicare. The fact is, they will. I'm also sure that there isn't a single person in this room who doesn't know that Dr. Hewson's industrial relations program will destroy the cooperative ethic, e ethic on which industrial relations is based or that he will throw people onto individual contracts and destroy 
their security, their wages and conditions, and their dignity. That is the third great deceit. Dr. Hewson's industrial relations policy is not designed to reduce unemployment, but to drive wages down. In fact, John Howard still has kept his industrial relations bill secret. Unashamedly, in a bald-faced, brazen way, he's sitting on legislation which is complete and won't show it because he knows it's about cutting the wages and salaries of Australians to ribbons. He knows it's about cutting their wages and salaries to pieces. He's monkey cunning, he's hanging onto it, and he's sitting onto it. I don't believe there's anyone here who doesn't know that Dr Hewson's plan for Australia is a plan of radical regression. A plan conceived in the bowels of a computer in the late 1970s using the Thatcherite software that was all the rage at John Hopkins University in those days. <laughs> Dr Hewson's so-called plan for Australia is an old plan that has failed wherever it's been tried with disastrous economic and social con consequences. My great fear is that the damage he could do in three years would take us decades to repair. That is, the scramble for gain based on avarice and greed, one group pitted against the other, all clambering, all clutching, all snatching, with heartless contempt for one's fellows, it'll be Gordon Gecko writ large. <laughs> Then there's the one about selling telecom to an overseas buyer for 20 billion. This is the one for the man who talks about national sovereignty and creating jobs and funding promises. On each of these counts, the telecom sale is a fraud. Does anyone think that Dr. Hewson will get 20 billion for telecom? Anyone I mean without a Liberal Party ticket burning in their pocket? <laughs> Does anybody seriously think there'll be more jobs if telecom is sold? The only way they could get anywhere near 20 billion would be to sell it overseas and remove all protection for Australian consumers and workers. It would mean timed local calls. It would mean a terrible thud, cr crunch in uh, tariffs for people who live in rural Australia and areas remote from the capital cities. And as well as that, it would mean huge job losses in the cities, in the towns, and another bit of our infrastructure will have gone. Creating jobs in telecom by selling it overseas is about as likely as creating jobs in tourism by making it cheaper to holiday in Honolulu or Bali <laughs> than it is in Cairns. <laughs> Which is what the GST will do. If you're going to go to Cairns from Melbourne or Sydney with a GST 15% attached, a lot of people just uh, move over to the International Terminal and head for Honolulu or Bali. Oh, there's another great deceit. And here is another little one. On every fight back pamphlet that has gone out in the last 12 months, the opposition claims it'll abolish seven taxes. One of them, the coal export levy, is a standing joke because it's already abolished. <laughs> there's another one under the heading of customs duties. But customs duty is the duty that's collected on the tariff. The coalition says it will abolish customs duty, which means it's abolishing tariffs. But when it suits them, they say, they're not for zero tariffs, not immediately, in some industries, in some electorates. Of course, both things can't be true. They're either abolishing customs duty and abolishing tariffs, or they're not. The whole plan of Dr Hewson is simply a deceit. He does not have a plan, he has an obsession. He doesn't have facts, he has gimmicks. And he's only one fact at his disposal, unemployment. The figures released today offer the one big negative fact of our national life at present. Unemployment is the great curse of the 90s. And it's apparent again in today's figures. Essentially, they are as you were figures, which makes the point that unemployment is going to be an immensely difficult problem to deal with, and it won't be fixed quickly. That's why we need the full focus of the nation's energies and why we don't need those energies dissipated in a divisive, unseemly scramble over a piece of the national cake. The figures mean simply that unemployment is too high. They also show that the unemployment rate may be flattening out, as the trend series shows, 
in uh, graphically in today's uh, bulletin, which is consistent with recent statistics showing that the economy is picking up. But this is really beside the point. If unemployment has in fact peaked, that's no reason for complacency. There's certainly no comfort for the unemployed. It's certainly no comfort for them. The central issue, therefore, is which party is best equipped to deal with unemployment. And that means it will succeed best at getting the economy moving. It also poses the question, which party is best equipped to help the unemployed directly? There's no simple answer to unemployment, but there is no doubt that the best answer in the long term and the short term is economic growth. And the way to get growth is by investing, and our efforts are aimed precisely at this point. Our efforts, meaning the government's efforts, are aimed entirely, precisely at this point. Investment in Australian companies by Australian companies. By contrast, it seems to me, beyond doubt, that Dr Houston's so-called plan will not be a remedy, but a new disease. If unemployment is our greatest problem now, how much worse will it be if we stifle the recovery with a 15% tax on virtually everything we buy and everything we use? Yeah. <laughs> how, much wor how much worse will it be if we deal with the problem of unemployment in an atmosphere of industrial and social turmoil? I mean, how much focus will we get to the problem while everyone is scrabbling over their share? How much harder will it be to find solutions or to find the concerted national will to solve the problem if the rest of the population is divided, insecure and rancorous? If unemployment's an ugly fact now, how much worse will it be without a universal health care system to help people who are unemployed in their sickness? or with an unfair education system which bars their kids from entry. If unemployment's a tragedy now, how much worse will it be with 10 billion taken out of the budget? How much worse will it be with social security spending cut? How much worse with, worse with funding for regional areas cut? How much worse with cuts to state services like state schools? How much worse with 800 million cut out of funds for the unemployed? and people left to wait much longer on those benefits. The labour market programs gutted. If unemployment is the worst fact of our national life at present, how much worse will it be if government gets out of the way, as Dr Houston says it should, and people are left to fend entirely for themselves? How much worse will it be if we put inflation back in the system? How much worse will it be if we add a tax burden and an accountancy burden and a time burden to the small businesses which we know are going to drive growth and create jobs. Since the campaign started, a raft of positive indicators have appeared illustrating our economic progress. Today's figures on job vacancies and retail sales were the most encouraging, Tuesday's figures, I'm sorry, on, on job vacancies and retail sales were the most encouraging since 1990. Our export figures have been positive Indeed, they've been the best for years. Today, this very day, if you distill the politics out of this morning's press, you'll find unequivocally positive economic news. There's a story about our continuing export surge, another about our growing manufacturing sector, another about an Australian company landing a billion dollar contract in Laos. There's much more, but John Hewson, of course, won't tell you. For 12 months, Wherever there has been hope, he's counselled despair. That's why today I've released a document accompanying this speech which describes some of the good things which are happening in Australia right now and which Dr Hewson refuses to talk about. There's no, there is no question that the direction we are going in is the right one. We are going too slow, slowly to lower the unemployment figure, but that's not a reason for changing course, for going backwards. It's no reason for going into reverse. It's a reason for accelerating progress where we can, and we've done this by lowering company tax rates, by introducing an investment allowance of 20%, and by cultivating a new banking culture. Every sensible thing that can be done to speed the pace of recovery and long-term reform is being done or is proposed for a second Keating government. 
and the things we do are all directed at the goal of creating employment and helping the unemployed through with training and other forms of assistance, not leaving them in the lurch as Dr Hewson would propose to do. Some of you will have seen the statistics released this week on the success of labour market programs. They're working, they're helping thousands and thousands of Australians. So why wreck the recovery? Why wreck the safety net, the humane and constructive government interventions? Why wreck the social fabric of Australia? My message for those people who are presently wondering whether to desert the Labor government is to think very carefully. Think about what you would lose. Think well about what you would lose. In an election, the choice is not between one party and a vacuum. It's a choice between two parties. Ask yourself whether by voting for policies which are proven failures elsewhere in the world, you won't be punishing Australia and the next generation of Australians. Ask yourself whether the absolute hollowness, the absolute fraudulence of Dr Hewson's campaign is not an indication that a vote for Dr Hewson is a leap into the dark. To the people of Australia between now and Saturday, I would say, every time you hear Dr Hewson say he has a plan, ask yourself, but do I understand? Do I understand it? Has he explained it to me? And the answer is no, or maybe, don't vote for him. In this forum this week, In this place this week, Dr Hewson had a chance to explain his so-called plan, a chance to explain how it would create a single job, how it would not destroy the social fabric of Australia, how it differs from the plans of Thatcher, Reagan, Douglas and Mulroney. He had a chance to explain it in this club and he refused. He chose to play soccer and shout slogans instead. <laughs> Let me give you the oldest advice in the world to the people who are contemplating the big jump. Don't do it. For your own sake, for your own sake, don't do it. But, but not only for your own sake, don't do it. For Australia's sake, don't do it. For your kids' sake, don't do it. Now, as Jim said earlier, I've been at the press club 18 times in the last decade. I've been four times in the past year. I don't know how many press conferences I've given in the last 12 months or how many doorstops that my staff said I let go on too long. I don't believe it can be said that I've ever run away from scrutiny or from the opportunity to explain our policies or failed to face up the ramifications of those policies. As Treasurer and then Prime Minister, I've taken full responsibility for the economic and social affairs of Australia. And all the responsibility that is mine, I will shoulder. All the damage that the recession has done, I'll attempt to repair. Every sensible thing that can be done will be done. Much of it is already being done and I want a chance to build on this. As I said in the campaign launch 15 years ago, I began to imagine an Australia which not only exported minerals and farm products but sophisticated manufacturers. The thought occurred to me and a few of my colleagues that Australia could be what no one had really ever imagined it could be and that is a country integrated with the world, focused on the region, competitive, creative, sophisticated, secure. And as every one of you know, this is happening. And as anyone old enough and compass met us in the 70s will know what a huge change there has been. <laughs> <coughs> You've heard the figures. Nearly one quarter of our total product, exporting 70% of it to Asia, exporting quantities of elaborately transformed manufacturers we never dreamed we could make. Some of you will have seen the McKinsey report on the new breed of Australian company which is emerging. Some of you will have noticed that in the last two months a two billion contract's been signed by BHP with the Vietnamese government. Could you imagine that in the 70s? And yesterday a billion dollar hydroelectric project in Laos, one of the largest construction projects yet in Indochina. These things are happening as a result of a conscious decision by the Australian people to change. These things are happening because we intended them to happen. The new Australia, the Australia of the 90s, will be different from the Australian of any other era. And the essential difference will be this. 
the Australia of the 90s will be one entirely conceived by Australians and brought into being by Australians and wearing the stamp Australia on everything it does. say that all of this is at stake on Saturday. Our economic future is at stake and so is the quality of our society, the Australian stamp of our society. So much is at risk. A society where childcare is finally a right, a society which believes women should get equal pay and be able to participate fully in all areas of work and life, a society which cherishes those who spend part of their lives caring for children or sick people. Those of you who know me will know what I believe. Whatever my faults, I don't think hiding my beliefs is one of them. <laughs> Very simply, I believe in creating a high wage, high skill and high productivity Australia. John Hewson believes in a low wage, low productivity country. John Hewson believes in dismantling the public sector. He hates the public sector. I believe in making the public sector as it is in every successful country, more efficient, more people oriented. John Hewson believes in fear in the workplace. He wants fear as the element in all of the Australian workplaces. I believe in cooperation and creativity in all Australian workplaces. John Hearson believes in private health insurance. I believe in sharing our personal health care risks through a national public and private system working in cooperation. John, yes. John Hearson believes in zero tariffs as an end in itself. I believe in using tariff reform as a fair benchmark to improve our industry with long-term plans and safeguards. John Hewson believes in American razzmatazz and hoopla and carefully staged passion plays and bun fights <laughs> and American advisers and American advertising cynics and gurus and the constant reiteration of poll driven phrases. I don't believe in it myself. I think it's an assault on good democratic Australian traditions. I think it's rubbish. I think one should face the music, scratchy, discordant, unpleasant music though it may be. I think you have to say what you believe and be prepared to defend it in detail. <laughs> this way at least, when people vote on Saturday, they'll know what they'll get with Paul Keating. To judge him by his campaign, but the same cannot be said of John Hewson. Finally, let me say this. If people are not convinced by Dr Hewson's intention to oppose a GST, to make Medicare a universal health system in name only, to destroy the basic rights of workers and the cooperative ethic of the Australian workplace, to turn our colleges and universities into businesses, to set back our environment programs a generation or more, if they're not convinced that Dr Hewson's policies represent a threat to our way of life and our values, perhaps it will help to think of it in philosophical terms. Dr. Hewson's philosophy is based on the idea of self-interest and survival of the fittest. Remember what Margaret Thatcher said. She said, there's no such thing as society, only individuals making their way. This is Dr. Hewson's philosophy. He doesn't believe in society as a whole. He wants to impose this barren, sterile idea on Australia. That's what he means by breaking the mould. What he doesn't like about Australia is the humanitarian collective ethos. The one that is there in Australia from the beginning of our European history until now. Think about it, the heroes of Australia have always been and remain the champions of the underdog. Now this may not fit well with the economics that Dr Hewson believes in, but it fits well with Australia. It's what we are, it's sprung from our history, it's what unites us, it's our principal bond between us. I hope we never see the day when our traditions are subverted by the doctrine of unmitigated self-interest. That's Dr Hewson's doctrine. If I fought him on nothing else as an Australian, I'd fight him on this. So if you're not persuaded that ripping up the social wage 
and introducing a giant flat tax will irrevocably damage the fabric and the way in life of Australia be persuaded by this, be persuaded by the philosophical change, the statements in the ethics, be persuaded by all those statements Dr Houston has made in the last couple of years, the most telling of which was the one in the budget reply when he said, we must, we must not reach back for people because they'll drag us down. The statement that st should have disqualified him, the statement, the statement that should have disqualified him from practising further in Australian public life. And this goes to the heart of it. Ultimately, this is the nature of the risk. John Houston has been projecting a more temperate image in recent weeks, of course. But perhaps the best reminder of John Houston's old fight back one persona came back in January in a speech by Ashley Goldsworthy, the Liberal Party's federal president. Goldsworthy said Australia needed a jolt. He said, life is to become tougher, he said, with less security and greater uncertainty. So be warned. This is the brave new world of John Hewson. Dog eat dog. Let the lucky and the rich prosper and the rest get, gather the crumbs that fall. Dr Hewson is an unashamed theorist of trickle-down economics. If he's allowed to become a practitioner of this theory, he'll turn Australia on its head. Call it scaremongering if you like. I do fear for Australia, I fear for the people, I fear for all those things which bind us together in which we believe above all other things. But it's not scaremongering, it's fact-mongering. Exposing the facts which Dr Hewson won't reveal by his non-appearance this week at the press club or anywhere else. I'm absolutely sure that Dr Hewson will be bad for Australia his agenda is radical, disruptive and destructive. I sincerely hope and believe Australians will recognise that they cannot take the risk. Thank you. can't have your encore first. Um, Prime Minister, you talked uh, yourself of the discordant, scratchy music, and I think it's about time for that. It's not, uh, it's certainly not going to be Marla, but some questions from, the, to use the terminology of modern pop music, the greatest grunge outfit in, uh, in Australia, the Press Gallery. Uh, a series of questions from our media members, there are plenty of them, and the first one comes from Julie Flynn. Julie Flynn, Radio 2UE and affiliated stations. Your main argument today has been that the uh, opposition will make things worse. But you've also conceded that uh, unemployment is stuck in a groove. Today's job figures show last month's growth in jobs has disappeared. The raw number of unemployed continues to climb over the one million mark. Youth unemployment's up to 32.5%. And we now have the longest period of sustained unemployment, over 10% since the Depression. Why would people who've been affected by unemployment, the recession, high interest rates, trust you for a fifth time? Well, I don't think unemployment necessarily is stuck in the groove. I think the way to look at the number is to say that the trend series shows that unemployment has peaked and is flattening out, which means that the prospect of it, bringing, of it coming down uh, looks on the, on the uh, latest figures rather better. That is, with retail sales running as strongly as they have, with exports running as strongly as they have, with national production up, uh, with uh, the other, the other uh, uh, figures of recent days and recent weeks, the job vacancies, the ANZ job vacancy series up 5%, the CES notified uh, vacancies up 13% on the equivalent period 12 months earlier, um, DEETS leading indicators all of these things, I think, give you an indication that, uh, that the figures, uh, the, strength of the, the strength coming through the economy and the labour market mean that we're probably seeing unemployment peak and hopefully we're starting to see it trend off. Laura Tingle. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. 
Uh, Laura Tingle from the Australian Prime Minister. Most of your speech today has been addressed at Dr Hewson's agenda. Um, and that your... And towards saying why you would be uh, offering more of the same, essentially why you think it's worked to date. But what mandate do you think you would gain if you actually did win office on Saturday? What do you think the mandate would be? Why do you really believe that people would be saying, yes, we really do want more of the same when uh, you've had given them three years of recession in your last term? Well, what, what is the same? Is the same the same as the 70s? Is it the same of the torpor of the 60s and 70s? Of course it isn't. It's, the, it's, it's more of the BHPs getting $2 billion contracts in Vietnam. It's more of the $1 billion contracts in Laos. It's more of the exports, it's more of the transformation, it's more education, it's more product innovation, it's more, be it's more best practice in Australian companies, it's more cooperation at the workplace, it's more productivity <coughs> focused, it's more cooperation, it's more decency, it's more collective national strength. Now to put all that asunder, because we've been through a recession, and to take the greedy, grubby, scratching politics and policies of the opposition, which would put Australians one against the other and lose that whole co uh, competitive and cooperative uh, ethos and ethic, would be to put our future down. And that's why I believe that the government offers not only the best prospects in the 90s, but the best prospects of getting back to stronger go growth and better employment. It's only by getting investment going will we be able to do that. It's only by reducing the tax on business as the government proposes in reducing the company tax rate from 39% to 33%, in accelerated depreciation, in a further investment allowance, it's only by a break to capital will you get the investment, not by putting the company tax rate up to 42%, as Dr Hewson proposes, not by putting a 24,000 million GST on business and making them collect it, not by slowing the economy down with a massive spending tax, but only by putting a charge into the investment and seeing it come down into the economy. And the charge is by way of a reduction in company rates, will give Australia the same tax rate as company tax rate as Singapore, much the same as the Asian region, while Dr Hewson goes the opposite way. This is why I believe the government can get the economy growing even faster than it is now, and is now growing at two and a half percent. Why I believe uh, we can get investment moving and with it employment. So the aim should be to learn by what happened in the recession and go on to do bigger and better things, but not to take our recessionary experience and regress and go back to the willful, mindless policies of Margaret Thatcher's Britain or Reagan's America to go back to the sort of greed is good syndrome, which is where the opposition wants to take it with all the problems which will attend it. The next question comes from uh, Malcolm Farr. Prime Minister Malcolm Farr from the Telegraph Mirror. You failed to make industrial relations uh, an issue of the magnitude you would have wanted in this campaign. The, the private polling and your own Labor Party polling shows it's just not sizzling away as you would like it. Is that because uh, 10 years of the cooperative ethic of the Accord has produced 11% unemployment and people aren't convinced that what you call the divisive, unseemly scramble of the opposition's policies don't look that bad? Well, I, I think that it is an issue in the campaign and I think it would be, it would be uh, a misjudgment by journalists to underestimate it. I think Dr. I think, uh, Dr. Hewson and Mr. Howard's uh, uh, brazenness in sitting on industrial legislation which can affect everyone's income and conditions of employment is understood by the electorate and they regard that sort of brazen behaviour poorly. And they're worried about it. They're worried about their jobs. And I think the message has got through that John Hewson has one policy with two arms, two prongs. That is tax up, wages down. Tax up with the GST, wages down by wage cuts delivered through a draconian industrial relations system. One which, uh, which uh, Sir Richard Kirby said this morning would be unfair and could lead to violence. I mean, that's the sort of uh, policies which I think people are worried about. 
But I've got some details from the Victorian employment contracts, and they're very, they're very interesting. Um, it says uh, just in one company, the contract is being presented to all new starters, penalty rates, it takes away penalty rates and overtime rates, any limits on hours worked, paid public holidays, they're either worked at the ordinary time rate or to be taken unpaid, plus superannuations deducted from the base rate of salary, instant dismissal for a wide range of reasons, including distributing written or printed matter without consent, and loitering in lavatories. <laughs> It is, it is journos, it is journos themselves who, uh, it is journalists themselves who would be most at risk by such contracts, as they are professional loiterers. Uh, and then, and then, and then there's another. Then there's another, where the contract takes away weekend penalty rates, overtime rates, and standard spread of hours. It takes away the 30-minute meal break, superannuation, and. Workers are changed from permanent to casual without being compensated by a casual loading. A worker who is late or absent without, within two hours notice, without two hours notice, has to pay the wages of the rest of the workers in that group for the length of time that worker is absent. <laughs> workers will not find out what their base rate of pay will be until they sign the contract. Or if we look in the medical industry, one contract here takes away penalty rates for weekend work and public holidays, shift allowances, reduces annual leave, sick leave and overtime rates, plus four nurses and medical re receptionists are to be sacked for refusing to accept the contract. The average cut to take home pay is about 35% or $151 a week and the employers refuse to take the employees union. The contract recommended by the AMI. Now, this yeah, that's right, that vicious little organisation. Now, these are the sort of things which industrial relations, which will be par for the course under John Houston's industrial relations. And is everyone going to accept that in a co the cooperative spirit of the last 10 years? Or are they going to get in and kick and thrash and claw and tear? Which is of course exactly what they'll do. And why wouldn't they? Uh, that's why I think industrial relations is a sleeper in this election. I think people do understand it, and they're not going to be convinced by little Johnny Howard's bluster on radio saying, <laughs> saying, how could I show it to the public without showing it to my colleagues first? <laughs> I mean, even that, I thought, would have made him blush, but it didn't. <laughs> the next question is from, uh, from Randall Markey. <clears throat> Uh, Randall Markey from the West Australian Prime Minister. Um, is it unfortunate and a bad example uh, to the electorate that on the very day uh, it has shown that uh, 1,052,800 people are out of work in Australia, that uh, politicians, including the Prime Minister, get a pay rise? I'm just wondering how you're prepared to scrap it. Given that the wages deal with the ACTU is contingent upon the creation of 500,000 jobs minimum in the next three years, why not link MPs' pay to future job growth? Well, MPs' pay is linked to public service salaries. And MPs' pay has fallen behind the rest of the community over the last 10 years. Uh, the fact of the matter is that MPs are now no longer treated specially or separately. They are only adjusted with the whole of the Commonwealth Public Service. And of course, they're adjusted uh, only on community standards uh, by any measure. And 1.4%, you'd hardly say that uh, that's an extravagant claim even with modest inflation. So I don't think it's, it's right or decent to draw the link between today's unemployment figure and the 1.4%. It's a sort of gimmicky question that I expect from the worst newspaper in the country, the West Australian. <laughs> question from Tony O'Leary. Tony O'Leary from the Herald Sun, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, I wonder if you've been describing the GST as the most pernicious tax in uh, Australia's history. Yes. I wonder why you're insisting also that uh, a future Labor government 
can't unscramble the egg, why you won't commit a future Labor government to abolishing it. And also, during the election campaign, you've also been insisting that uh, there's a push on into Asia. I wonder if you could tell us then why Singapore Airlines didn't get a slice of the Qantas action uh, under your government. They, well, let me deal with the second question first, because they wouldn't pay for it. Yeah. And we weren't going to give it away, Tony. It's as simple as that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but uh, they were given every opportunity. They were encouraged. Uh, I actually saw their, ch their chief executive officers in Singapore during my visit there. They were, they were encouraged. In the end, uh, they thought they could have it on the cheap, and they found otherwise. As it is, with, as it is with British Airways, uh, all, most British investment in airlines in Asia were tied up in Cathay Pacific. And when that went to other owners, the former BOAC or British Airways had virtually no routes in the Asia Pacific area. There's a very nice fit between British Airways and Qantas, and it's because of the niceness of that fit that British Airways paid more money, and that's why they, that's why they received it. But let me go to the other question, which is a question of greater, of greater significance, and that is the question of why a consumption tax can't be repealed. The fact is, when you take 24 billion from people and set up a system like this and then disperse the proceeds, that's the end of it. There's no way of reversing it. There's no way that any government could come in and uh, reimpose uh, the kind of... Uh, uh, taxes that we have with uh, the likes of payroll tax or, or change the, ch the changed outlays priorities of a government based on those sorts of revenues. Once this thing is in, it's in forever. And I think that's what the Australian public should know. I mean, they may say, we've had the recession, we, why should we re-elect the government? But if they re-elect the government, in three years' time they get another choice. They never get another choice with a GST. It's here forever. And that's the point I made the other day with John Hewson. He said, what could be worse than another three years of labour? And it's a very simple answer, a GST forever. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and that, is, that is the fact of it. That is, this is an enormous step. And it's a very, uh, this is the, the first country in the world that'll have a free choice about whether it has a GST. All the others were imposed by governments in office without choice. Those other communities never really had a chance to say no. Australians have a chance to say no. They've had a chance to think about it and they've been warned. They've been warned by the Canadians, they've been warned by New Zealand, and they've been warned by the British. And I don't know whether you noticed today in a news report uh, that uh, in a wire service report, Britain is now considering increasing its VAT from 17.5%, increasing the rate, and it said on VAT there are various options including a widening in the tax base to cover such items as magazines, newspapers, food, energy and children's clothing. And it went on to say an increase in Britain's value-added tax, which is a GST, is high on the agenda for next week's UK budget, which comes three days after, the Australia, after, after Australia votes. So here's another, another warning signal from Britain, as if the large one we had from Canada wasn't sig significant or sufficient, or the constant declarations and protestations from New Zealand don't give us the warning that we've got a free choice in this matter, don't take it, don't take a GST. This community can make that judgment and can make that decision and not be locked into it to find that we're stuck with it forever. Peter Charlton. Peter Charlton from the Korea Mail, Prime Minister. Queensland's a state that uh, seems to have weathered the recession better than many others, yet Wayne Goss has warned of a, a collapse in the Labor vote. Do you share that pessimism? Uh, if so, what do you put it down to, the collapse in the Labor vote? Do you find such warnings helpful? Well, I don't think the Labor vote has collapsed. It might, have, it might have gone off the boil somewhat, but again, that doesn't necessarily imply we'll lose any seats from it. And uh, I'm not sure that the tactic of saying to people that, uh, uh, you know, trying to hurry them back into the tent, as it's put, uh, telling people that uh, one party or another's off the boil so that their traditional supporters will sort of scurry back to them is uh, a tactic of worth. I think the public can, are smart enough to make their own judgments about all these things. And uh, that's why I believe that, that the government's position is strong enough 
to see it returned, uh, that the seats can be identified and have been identified by people on both the Labor and the Conservative side of politics. Tom Burton. Uh, Tom Burton from the Australian Financial Review, Mr Keating. Um, could you outline your intentions regarding your ministry if you're re-elected? How extensively do you, intend to, do you intend to reshape the Cabinet and the ministry? And what principles will you use to uh, choose your ministry? For example, will you be wedded to the normal factional split where members get a ministry not necessarily because of ability but because of factional alignment? And will you also reject the traditional distributions which have often led to the same result and demand that you should be free to choose the best ministry possible? Well, I think, I think the, the return of the government provides the, Labor, the, Labor, the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party with a great opportunity, uh, particularly as, uh, as is well known, quite a, quite a number of members of the current ministry will be not either contesting the election or retiring. So this, this creates a number of natural vacancies uh, and as well as that, after each election, there is always uh, the option of the par parliamentary party to choose new people. And I would think this presents an opportunity for choosing younger people, fresh people, and I think it would give us a great opportunity to reinvigorate the government uh, from a party which is, uh, has in its back bench uh, a, a, a quite a number of people who will make a major contribution, can make a major contribution to our national life. It's a great opportunity for us and I'm quite sure the Parliamentary Labor Party would not let it pass by without taking that opportunity up. Brendan Burns. Brendan Burns from the Press New Zealand. Prime Minister, if you win on Saturday, will there be an improvement in the relationship with New Zealand or do uh, the differences over industry and other policies mean that that will continue to be marred at a political level and uh, at the CER level? Oh, I don't, I don't think there's any problem in relations between Australia and New Zealand. Uh, uh, We've got, uh, you know, this is, not a, this is not a party matter. We've got members of the Labor Party in New Zealand coming over to sell us their barren creed. Uh, we, have, uh, we have members of the Conservative parties over there trying to sell us the same stuff. Um, uh, it's all taken with the sport. I think that um, we know and understand it to be. Uh, but essentially, uh, these... Uh, New Zealand's place in Australia is best reflected, of course, in those, those uh, constitutional caveats, which are there, always there, waiting. Uh, for, uh, for New Zealanders to join us in the most complete way possible. <laughs> Ross Peake. Ross Peake from the Canberra Times, Prime Minister. Um, immigration numbers have gone down because of the recession. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're re-elected, re um, can you give us an idea of what immigration might numbers might do, given that we've now got growth in the economy? Do you think in mid-year they'd be set to, to go up, stay the same, or come down further? Well, we've cut the migration intake back from about 140,000 a year to about 80,000 a year. So it's just on half of what it was two and a half or three years ago. And uh, that's because the economy is not producing as much employment, therefore we're not taking as many people. But we don't abandon the program altogether because you can't, re you can't wind it up quickly when you need it to make those additions to the labour market, that, complement that complementary quality uh, to our society which immigration has brought. I think we just make a judgement as time goes on about uh, the strength of the economy, the lift in the labour market, and see then whether, the, whether we can make a judgement to increase the intake. But that would be a matter for seeing at the time. Ray Brindle. Ray Brindle, Knight Ritter Financial News, Prime Minister. You mentioned in your speech the unequivocally positive economic news, yet only about 10 days ago Mr Dawkins virtually endorsed a post-election rate cut. Um, what caused the big change in your government's view and indeed, is economic growth now sufficiently strong to preclude any further interest rate cuts? Well, well, back in January, I think the bank itself said there was a case for, they could see a case for reduction in interest rates, except for the exchange rate. Volatility on the exchange rate, well, the exchange rate settled down in the meantime, and uh, 
Can I say also that this government doesn't have a wages problem. If a coalition government's elected with a GST, an inflation problem rattling down the road and a huge wages problem, I think the Reserve Bank and its board would be most loath to cut interest rates. But I think upon the return of a Labor government uh, where we don't have such problems, um, it might be uh, then possible for the bank and the government to make an early, an early move on rates. That is, given the fact that we've got a cord mark seven in place, we've got a low inflationary environment at the moment, and heaps of productivity. Uh, the next question is from Ken Davidson. Uh, Ken Davidson, The Age Prime Minister. Uh, you've painted uh, Dr Houston as an uh, as a economic rationalist, uh, warts and all. Um, are you really also an economic rationalist who's attempting to paint yourself with a pretty face at the moment? Well, I don't, I'm not, I'll tell you what I'm not, Ken, I'm not an economic irrationalist. <laughs> but but n nor am I a slave to the, to the nostrums of the market so that the market is only right and always right and I never have been. I never have been. I mean, when I introduced, uh, or when I was uh, party to, the decision which made uh, uh, the cross-media rule in our media, I thought that intervention in that industry was necessary because the market wouldn't sort it out. Well, it would sort it out all right. It would have been all owned by two people. And that's why I believe that one had to make such a decision. It's why I believe that, that prudential, supervision, uh, prudential supervision of banks should be put into legislation, that it wasn't no longer appropriate to have a phone call up and down Martin Place and everything would be hunky-dory, that we needed actually to put it into law. So, I mean, never have I believed that, it's, that, that the market, the market, the market and the pursuit of income and, uh, the, you know, the pursuit of rewards is the sole way to go. That's what John Hewson believes. But the great furphy that he's putting to us in this is that he's saying, if we introduce a major GST and we cut the price of petrol in a country which already has cheap petrol in world terms and we abolish payroll tax, a relatively minor tax, which has not been in the public debate until now, not for recently. If we re abolish payroll tax and cut petrol, presto, we'll have a new society in a new country. Now, what total rubbish, what total and complete rubbish, that to change an economy like Australia to a sophisticated manufacturing and services country, fueled by a good education system, to change all that and deal with all of those sect sectoral areas of the microeconomy, transport, wharves, air transport, land transport, telecommunications, workplace culture. They're the things that have to change. But to think you can change all that by abolishing payroll tax and cutting the price of petrol. If I'd have stood up and said that to you in any one of 16 or 17 statements in the last 10 years, you'd have laughed me out of this room. And yet that's the central thesis of, of the opposition's fight back policy. It's, it's an absolute fraud of a policy. And it's supposed to be all relying upon if we clear, everything, clear the decks and let the rich have a clean go at it, we'll be all better off. Now that's the reward and the greed stakes. That's the Gordon Gecko view. And that's why John Hughes is still chanting incantations at Liberal Party rallies, because he can't, he can't defend that policy. It's indefensible. How could you say in a country that doesn't need a consumption tax that we're loaded up with a $24 billion GST and then we'll abolish payroll tax and cut the price of petrol and all of a sudden, presto, we have a new country. <laughs> That's what he's told us. It's rubbish. The next question, the next question, is, from, uh, the next question is from Don Wolford. Don Wolford from Australian Associated Press, Mr Keating. I'd like to ask um, in the context of what you've said about fairness, uh, a question about um, Accord 7 and its links between job growth and wages. Isn't it true that under the Accord, it will be those workers who fail to secure an enterprise agreement and who thus require safety net provisions, um, who will be asked to forego wage rises if your job growth expectations aren't met? Um, doesn't that mean, therefore, that the full burden of wage constraint will fall exclusively on that part of a workforce which almost by definition is the lowest paid and the industrially weakest? Well, I think it means, Don, that, the, that those in the, if you like, the more competitive areas of the labour market 
find their own wage increase through a productivity change. In other words, there's no cost to the employer. They negotiate an enterprise agreement where productivity increases and the reward is split between profits and wages. Uh, so that's the position we're talking about. But if we're talking about costs to business and cost to industry, we're saying let there, let there not be costs other than the event that we can see progress in the economy and progress towards higher levels of employment. And where we can see that, well then fine, those sort of costs are not going to impair our national progress. Now I think that balance is, is pretty good. And I might add, mind you, that a lot of, a lot of those people uh, will find that as people in the lower deciles of the income uh, of, of the in system will also have the benefits of our tax cuts, which are cutting the middle rate from 38 cents to 30 cents in the dollar, without a GST, without a GST. And that will also supply them with benefits. And that's why in Accord Mark 7, the tax cuts are regarded importantly for those reasons. So, but if we are growing, if we are growing, and we have demonstrable progress towards an achievable minimum of 500,000 jobs over three years, therefore then, the cost to be borne by business in general we think are reasonable ones because the volume that will come from the economy will see their bottom line be in much better shape. The next question is from uh, Bradley Perrott. Uh, Bradley Perrott, Prime Minister from Reuters. Last night when Paul Lynham asked you to say sorry for the million unemployed, you explained, you explained those parts of the problem that weren't your fault, such as the international economy. I wonder if you'd explain to us which parts were your fault. Well, I think that... Uh, I think that... Uh, uh, I mean, no government can go through a change like this without making mistakes. The change of this has a huge magnitude. And uh, I think interest rates stayed on too high for too long. But again, can I say, monetary policy is not operated exclusively by the government. Let me say that I would have brought the rates down much more rapidly. But I could only do it by dragging the Reserve Bank along with me. Now, nobody in this election is imputing to the Reserve Bank no one in this election is imputing any blame for the unemployment of the Reserve Bank. It falls upon the Prime Minister or the Treasurer, in my case, having been both, onto me. And yet monetary policy is actually decided by an appointed board that's not elected, 